Hi, and welcome back to Ron Hasn't Seen, and to part two of our great movie ride-inspired series with 1931's The Public Enemy. This is a gangster film that was directed by William A. Wellman and written by Kubik Glassman and John Bright, based on their unpublished novel, Beer and Blood. Obviously, this would appear inside the gangster scene of a great movie ride, uh, with James Cagney greeting you as you come into the room. Uh, James Cagney stars as Tom Powers, uh, Edward Woods as his friend Matt Doyle, along with their series of girlfriends who are Joan Blundell, Mae Clark, and Jean Harlow. See, the movie opens with an almost sitcom-esque series of character intro shots, followed by a disclaimer decrying the actions of the characters in the film, setting it up to be really a morality play. The film starts with a very young Matt and Tom being kind of general hoodlums in turn-of-the-century Chicago. They're running from the cops, they're bullying Tom's sister, and they're fencing small goods like stolen watches. We then see them grow up to teenagers where they get their first real criminal work, assisting in a robbery, and the robbery goes wrong, ending in the death of one of their cohorts and a cop. So this is when things turn serious for them. Uh, we see them as young adults, setting up their own heist, and then start bootlegging when Prohibition kicks in. Uh, we see this make some loads of money. They become successful, they're spending it. They're the talk of the town. But Tom's brother, who just came back from the war, isn't happy with Tom and the way he's making his money. Uh, eventually the bootlegging business leads to a gang war, uh, where Matt is killed. Uh, after this, Tom goes to the rival gang to seek revenge, and he's injured in the process and hospitalized. Right before he's about to be released from the hospital, he's kidnapped, this all takes place off screen, and his boss, Patty Ryan, then decides he's giving up the business if Tom is returned. Uh, the other gang drops Tom's dead body off at the house after promising to return him, and this is where the family is getting ready for him to return home. And his body falling in through the front door is kind of the way the movie ends. And we're left, you know, seeing what a life of crime could bring you. So, so as I said, the movie is really much more of a morality play with Tom being the bad guy than something like Goodfellas. Tom is constantly presented as cruel, going back to trying to trip his sister as a kid. And it's like showing a eventual serial killer torturing animals. That's what it really felt like to me watching the film. He's cruel and dismissive of his girlfriends. Uh, he There's a famous scene where he takes a grapefruit, completely unprovoked, and just kind of grinds it into his girlfriend's face. This uh, scene, there's been some controversy of whether this was supposed to happen in the script or if it was supposed to be a play on set and made it into the film. There's just been some discrepancies over the year, years on that, but suffice it to say, it became a famous scenes reference in some of Cagney's later work. Uh, it might be the most famous shot of the movie. Um, but he's also, like, he forces Matt to leave his own wedding to commit a revenge murder. Uh, he fights with his family. He does this weird little punch as a greeting to, like, his mom and his girlfriends, like something like teenage boys would do to each other like on the shoulder he does it to like their faces but i guess maybe that i've seen it done other times and i guess maybe it does come from this movie but it's very blatant we're not supposed to see him as a hero or a protagonist unlike say in goodfellas where henry hill is presented in a much more whitewashed way than say uh pesci or de niro's characters are even if this might not have been as true of the real Henry Hill, you know? I actually was wondering if, like, Michael Corleone was based off Tom's brother, who's also named Michael, comes back from the war a hero, doesn't want to be associated with the brother's business until he gets a little bit involved at the end trying to help his family. I guess that kind of felt like Michael Corleone to me. Um, maybe that's just where they get the name. Maybe it's just a coincidence. But that's what was occurring to me as I was watching the film. And Tom's compelling... But you don't feel like you're rooting for him. Like, he's a good character. You want to see where his story goes, but you don't want him to win out in the end. And maybe this is why Cagney felt the role typecast him in the future, as opposed to things he liked doing, like Footlight Parade. 
and maybe if you followed Matt as a main character, you would have rooted for him as more of a loyal friend caught up rather than his villain if Tom was the one driving everything. And this was actually the original casting where Woods was going to play Tom and Cagney was going to play uh, Matt, but they switched roles uh, kind of late in the stage just because they thought that's how they fit best. The film did make over three times its 150k budget. There's a little discrepancy if it was 150 or like 230k uh, when it was made, but it made over five hundred thousand dollars, which for 1931 wasn't too bad. Uh, it was called a derivative gangster film at the time, but now it seems more like a, a pattern for them. But what they said, the production quality and the acting holds it up. It does feel that way. It does feel like the stereotypical gangster downfall film, but really good fellas in Casino are too. So it was actually also a pre-production code film, so you see him get away with a lot of stuff you wouldn't expect in, you know, near future. Like, uh, you see him being fitted by, like, a stereotypically gay, effeminate tailor. Tom's boss, Patty Ryan's wife, seduces him while he's drunk and he can't really fight his way off fight her off uh and the next morning he regrets doing what he's doing and that's what makes him run out of the house where they get ambushed and matt gets shot so those two scenes were actually cut out of the later showings once the production code hit there's some other fun things that happen on this well fun things that happened on the set where as typical in these things the punch that uh michael throws at tom ends up connecting uh and they actually kind of plan it to connect but not as hard actually uh, damaged one of Cagney's teeth, and he just kept playing through the role, you know. As much as they overacted at this time, it's a good portrayal, and it, I could see why he got typecast this way. And the other one is they actually use some live rounds when shooting at actors in this. There's a scene where Tom's hiding behind a wall, and they're firing at him, and there are real bullets in the walls. Now there'd be squibs behind bricks and things like that, but... I can't imagine anything like that like happening today. Like, look at what's been happening with Rust in the news uh, at the time of the filming. It's still just about to go to trial. But like, just them the idea of live rounds on set, let alone being shot at someone, is so foreign. All in all, I'd say it's worth a watch. Uh, you could see how the genre films are Scorsese and Coppola and even a little bit of Tarantino. Uh, developed out of this film but once again the main difference is we're told to hate the main character it's not just implied we are told at the beginning these are the dregs of society and this is the criminal underworld and they prey on good people like you the audience unlike those films where we see kind of the de niro character or someone like mr white in uh reservoir dogs are more likable but and you still have the crazy guys like Mr. Blonde, Michael Mazin's character, or all the Pesci characters. So we have the criminals we're supposed to like, and the criminals we're not supposed to like. In this, we're just not supposed to like it. And it is his cruelness. As I said, the grapefruit, the tripping. He's just unlikable, and we're supposed to see that in his lifestyle. It's not just, he's glam it looks glamorous, but he's still apparently unhappy because he's being this cruel. And that's what makes it more of a morality play than a modern gangster film. Watch it. It's a short film. It's under 90 minutes. It tells a fast-moving story. It keeps you entwined. Uh, the writing and acting can sometimes make the characters look like caricatures, uh, and the mob names like Nails or Putty feel right out of Dick Tracy, but that was really a product of the times. you got to realize, I mean, at this point, this movie is over 90 years old. I mean, even the classics like Godfather at this point are over 50. So there's a big gap between those and a lot of movie making changed in those times and but the, you could tell they studied this film and that's the important part so it's worth a quick watch uh, and that's gonna be it it's uh gonna be another short episode uh thank you guys for watching ron hasn't seen and we're gonna be continuing next week uh with tarzan the ape man from the 1930s Starring Johnny Weissman as part of our great movie ride collection. Uh, once again, if you like what I'm doing, please like, subscribe, comment below. And we'll see you next week. Good night.